All right. Welcome to today's First Friday, um, Benson Management First Friday. Regrettably, the Bensons could not be here today, but they sponsored the whole uh, the whole series. So let's give them a round of applause because they're working hard for us. All right, so today we're going to be delighted um, to welcome Scott Swenson. Scott Swenson is going to tell you more about himself, but I will tell you when um, Jeff Meyer, I mean, they're all making fun of me up here, but Scott and his wife, Cynthia Beyer, they own their own company. They are just, you know, exponential, you know, um, entrepreneurs. But the thing that got me, like the first words out of Jeff's mouth is that Scott was vice president of Polaris Snowmobiles. How many of you are snowmobilers? Okay, we don't have a lot of you. Wow. Okay, all three of us. Anyway, yeah. anyway, so I was in a Pol I was a Polaris family. All right, so when I heard that, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to get him. But understand, he owns his own major company now, so that that Polaris thing is behind him. Anyway, the other thing that uh, that is very unique for Scott for that's going to have great impact on the college independent of his um, presentation today, is the fact that he and his wife, Cynthia Beyer, have decided that they're going to um, support for five years the first ever faculty fellowship at UWL. That is a big deal where we have uh, alums standing up and saying, we need to support faculty. So we have to give him a big hand for that because it's a big deal. It's unique and different. <laughs> All right, so on behalf of the Board of Advisors, the College of Business faculty and staff, and our student host for today, um, Beta Alpha Psi, I give you Scott Swinson. Good afternoon. So it's, uh, it's my kind of crowd. Uh, every class I was in, the whole four years I was in lacrosse, back of the room. So uh, I, I'm exactly like you guys. I try to get here early so I can get in the back row. Saw those guys walk in, they got there like, I'm them, I know who you are. So theme's hard, right? When you're trying to figure out what to present to a group of people that are 30 years younger than you. So I started out and uh, I've used a theme in the past by this singer called Meatloaf. Um, yeah, just the old guys shaking their heads. So when, when I was in school, I spent a lot of time at this bar called Sidekicks. Um, which doesn't exist any longer either, so that's another thing that goes over your head. But at the end of the night, Sidekicks always played this meatloaf song. It was when, you know, the bar was closing and you had to go home and find the after party type of thing. Um, so I've gone back to meatloaf for advice throughout my career, and I was thinking about it, and one of my favorite sayings that meatloaf says is, he says, ain't going to find a coupe de ville at the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. And I'm like, they don't know what a Coupe de Ville is. They don't know what a Cracker Jack box is. So there's zero chance I can use meatloaf as my theme for this uh, presentation. So I made a pivot. And I thought, what's in common to all of us? Dr. Seuss. I mean, everybody's read Dr. Seuss. Everybody can relate to Dr. Seuss. So we're going with Dr. Seuss as our theme today, kind of reverting back to when we were about two years old. Um, we can all relate to that era. So here we go. Um, maybe not. Huh. It's on. Click. How about page down? Oh, there, that works. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk while he works on that. Um, so I was here a long time ago, um, class of 1985, and uh, I know a lot of you guys are accounting students. How many are here getting extra credit? Okay, if you need help afterwards, come and see me. I'll help you pass the extra credit thing, sign off on something, um, so you don't have to waste a lot of time taking notes, because there won't be anything in this that's really that valuable anyway. Um, so just come up, I'll sign it, and you'll get the extra credit, and it'll all be fine. Um, majored in accounting, minor in finance. Um, I, I went back and I said, what, what did I really like? I, I went to a business law class. It was on like Tuesday night. It was a local lawyer, and he talked about John Elway, about 
50% of the time in the class because John Elway was in the middle of a big contract dispute. He used it as all the examples, and I was like, hey, I can relate to that guy. I hated English lit. You ever read Beowulf? Anybody? I mean, oh, God. Why would they t force anybody to read Beowulf? I mean, I, I just, it's like the dumbest thing in the world. So I, I have the accounting cred. I took all those classes. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, if you want to quiz me on different accounting stuff, I got a shot at it from what I can remember. Um, lived in Reuter for a year, lived in Drake for a year, lived for two years at a, at a house on Market Street, 1601 Market Street. Um, that's the crew that lived there. Some early lessons in entrepreneurship. It's kind of going to be a theme throughout this presentation. Um, so twice a year, we had a huge kegger. Um, made tons of money, like probably a couple thousand dollars. I mean, tons of people. Um, we used that money to fund our house. Um, so toilet paper, all those kind of essentials type of thing. And I was the guy that was responsible for the money. So you think about your roommates, right? You got this fund over here that has lots of money and they don't have anything. They need to go buy beer. And they're like, come on, Scott, just give me a few bucks to buy beer. So it's the early lessons in budgeting, taking care of your money through a kegger. I mean, you can't beat that. Um, I put a rejection letter up there. So when I graduated, OK, this is, this is before computers. So you're typing out resumes and applications to colleges or to companies. I had 88 rejection letters. And it was kind of the gig, right? We hung them up on the bulletin board, and everybody got to look at all my rejection letters. The, the reason is I, I didn't want to live around here, so I wanted to go south. I wanted to go somewhere where it's warm. You know, if you're walking from 16th and Market to college every day in the wintertime, you go, there's got to be better places to live than La Crosse, Wisconsin. So finally, after 88 rejections or so, I found a place that would hire me. So I went to work for Shell Oil Company out of college um, in Bakersfield, California. And that is a pretty good representation of Bakersfield, California. Um, it is California, but they call it the armpit of California. So everybody out there is kind of disdainful of Bakersfield. I thought it was the greatest place in the world. It's sunny every day. Temperatures generally above 70 degrees. Super cool place from that standpoint that you can go see lots of stuff. Eventually got transferred to Houston. Um, Rode lots of helicopters out to the Gulf of Mexico because I was responsible for the platforms out there. Did several different accounting jobs. Did pass my CPA. So again, in case I need accounting cred, I do have that. Um, couple lessons. So Dr. Milner said, can you mix in some lessons with kind of the what you did in your life? Um, so the first lesson I learned when I graduated and then started working at Shell is that I could compete with anyone. So I grew up in a small town, about 2,000 people in southeastern Minnesota, a place called Zimbroda. Um, and you know, there isn't a lot of competition in Zimbroda. And then I came to La Crosse, and clearly a bigger school, but not the biggest school in the world, and was pretty successful here. And you kind of always wonder, you know, what happens when I compete against the people from the bigger schools or the broader backgrounds or that kind of thing. I learned quickly that I could compete with anyone. I also learned that you got to be curious, OK? As accountants, we're generally more introverted as personalities. I, I'm sure I'm shocking some of you here. Um, but we tend not to use our words as often as we should. Um, and I would guess the first 10 years of my uh, marriage, my wife told me to use my words more times than I can possibly count. So one of the things that I learned when I first started working is that I needed to talk more. People couldn't read my mind. It wasn't good enough that I just did the analytics, but I had to actually communicate with people. So use your words. Dr. Milner talked to me a lot about soft skills as we were preparing for this, and you guys working on your soft skills. The other thing you'll learn as you progress in your careers is the soft skills are as important, if not more important, than the technical skills. That being able to relate with people, being able to work on a team, 
being able to walk up to somebody, shake their hand, look them in the eye, being able to sit in your boss's office and not get the shakes because you're so nervous you're in there. All those things are what drives your success in life. And those are the things that it's super important to work on, not only now, but for the rest of your lifetime. I put up the last thing in the lower left for a reason. So when I left Shell after five years, um, one of my bosses came up to me and he said, are you running away from something or are you running to something? And his point was, every time you make a career change, you should be trying to progress, you should be trying to move up, move to something. In that particular case, I was getting the hell out of Houston, Texas, because I hated it. And uh, I didn't really care where I was running to. So I knew I was running away from something. But after that, I always kind of took that in the back of my mind whenever I made a change. So when I ran away, I ended up at a place called General Electric. Um, you guys have probably heard of it. I uh, spent about eight years there, primarily in financial roles, um, did fleet leasing in Eden Prairie, uh, went down to, Baker, or to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and worked on a credit card for Sam's Club, um, and then did medical equipment leasing in uh, suburb of Milwaukee. You know, the, the things that I learned when I was at GE um, is the value of financial literacy. The people that were successful in GE, and for me, ever since then, are the people that knew the numbers, the people that could read the financial statements, probably more than read them, they could interpret them, they could identify where the opportunities are, and it's what gives accountants so much of a step up over somebody. Are there any marketing people in here? Okay, then I can bash, oh, only one marketing guy. So I can bash marketing the rest of the guy. So it's what gives the accounting people a huge step up over all the marketing people, because the marketing guys can't really understand the numbers. They're all just kind of flash with no substance, where you guys are the substance people that can kind of help that marketing guy along as he does the flash. So understanding the numbers and being able to kind of communicate those to the rest of the organization is one of those key things that I learned when I worked at GE. The second thing I learned is it's OK to volunteer for a job nobody wants. So you see one of the jobs I had up there was securitization manager. Nobody knows what securitization is. I'm not going to try to explain it, because it would bore you even more than the rest of my presentation does. But nobody wanted the securitization manager job. I said, I'll give it a shot. And it actually turned out that I won a trip to the Greek Isles because I was so good at being securitization manager. So in that particular, particular case, volunteering for a job nobody else wanted not only led me to success in that role, but propelled me into other things. The other lesson I learned there is you better wear socks if you're going to work for GE. So this is a true story. So when I'm moved up to Minneapolis. I'd lived in the South for the last five years. And when you live in the South and you're 20-some years old, you don't wear socks. And so I came up to Minneapolis, and my habit was not to wear socks. One day, the HR person called me into the office and said, I just talked to the president, and he said that I needed to communicate to you that if you don't start wearing socks to work, we're never going to promote you. Serious. So can you imagine that somebody tells, is looking close enough to know whether you're wearing socks and then deciding whether you can get promoted based on whether you wear socks or not? I did wear socks after that because I wanted to get promoted. Although, if I figured out I could get away with it, I might not have put them on every now and then. The other thing that I would take from my uh, GE time is, while I was there, I worked for a guy named Jack Welch. He was CEO. Not like he spent a lot of time in my office. But if you get an opportunity, read one of his books. I mean, he is a super knowledgeable management leadership type guru with kind of real world common sense type stuff. And I know he's a super old guy now, but a lot of what he writes, talks about, still translates to today. And I use the lessons I learned there every single day up till now. So I was looking for a change, um, wanting to get back to Minnesota, where my family was from. 
Um, so I took a job with a company called Polaris. Um, when I joined Polaris, it was about a billion dollar company. Um, when I left Polaris, it was about a $5 billion company. Um, and had a lot of fun at Polaris. I started out as treasurer and then eventually moved into more management, general manager type roles, running parts, garments, and accessories, the stuff in the left, the snowmobiles that most of you don't understand what they are. They're vehicles that go on snow really fast. Um, and then the electric vehicles, which are vehicles that go on the road really slow. Um, so those are the different jobs that I had in Polaris. And you can see we were pretty successful during my 15 years that we were there because we had a great team. So I made a couple of really good career choices while I was at Polaris. Um, one of the first choices I made was that I came from a financial services industry when I moved to Polaris, and they didn't have a financial services business. So I said to my boss, the CFO, I said, I can start a financial services business here. And he's like, sure, go for it. Give it a try. Um, so I went and presented to the Polaris Board of Directors. And I don't know what I was at that point in time, probably 35, something like that. Um, and this was a huge deal to me to present to the Board of Directors. I'm like, you know, I made it. This is success. I, I, I probably worked for weeks on that presentation. I went in there. I'm not sure anybody was awake through the entire presentation. It looked, I'm pretty sure half of them dozed off and the other half weren't paying attention. And uh, I asked if there was any questions and the chairman of the board said to me, um, don't F it up and use the real word. And uh, so that's a, one of those memories you have forever is, uh, he didn't really care any about the details. He just wanted to make sure that I didn't do anything to mess up his uh, stock price. So that always stayed high on my list of uh, things to remember. So I did that. I was pretty successful. You can see it's worth about $57 million in income right now. Um, the next thing I did is I told my boss I'm bored. What else do you have? And he said, well, we're moving into this new headquarters. How would you like to oversee that project? And I said, I don't know anything about that, but it's project management. You can probably figure it out, right? So I got to oversee the, the building and move into Polaris' new headquarters. I, I got to walk through Wittick before this, and it kind of reminded me of that time and how much fun it was to see that building go from nothing to finally moving in and seeing our cool products on the showroom floor and all those kind of things. Um, so super non-traditional type of project for somebody that's in accounting. But it was where between those two that people said, I think this guy might be able to run a business. He doesn't seem like a total idiot. Um, they did find out later I was a total idiot. We'll get into that part. Um, so eventually, after running a business for a while, they promoted me into snowmobiles. And this was another one where I volunteered. and. Probably one of those where most people that are sane wouldn't volunteer. So at the time, Snowmobiles was losing about $20 million and then lost 10 points of market share. Um, we had major quality issues. We had no new innovation. And what was our most profitable legacy business had become a drag on the rest of Polaris's earnings. So I said, let's take a risk. And we put basically all our eggs in a basket of building the first progressive rear suspension snowmobile, which means nothing to any of you guys except for Dr. Milner. So her and I will talk about it after the presentation. But basically what it means is if you go over a big bump, you don't feel it in your lower back, which is a huge thing if you're a snowmobiler. Um, so we took that risk and kind of turned the business around. And I'd say those are the three things that kind of propelled me from being what Everybody made fun of me as a bean counter to an actual entrepreneur. So one of the things Dr. Milner asked me to talk about was my career disasters. She thinks it's fun, I guess, for those of us that come up here to say, you know, we almost got fired. Here's what happened. Here's true confessional. I don't know. It seems a little weird to me, but I, I'm in for it. So first career disaster. So I got promoted to my first big job, which was general manager, parts, garments, and accessories. Um, 180 million business, 
most profitable in Polaris, about 100 team members. And at that point in time, we were very snow dependent. So we were dependent on selling jackets, helmets, um, accessories for snowmobiles. And the first winter that I was in that job, it didn't snow at all. I went back and looked, and it was the warmest winter in 70 years. Okay, so in a big company, the cardinal sin is to miss your numbers. Okay, that if you have a budget or a forecast, you figure out how to hit your numbers. And not only did we miss the budget, but we missed forecast one, forecast two, forecast three, and forecast four. At this point in time, my boss, who was the CEO, called me into his office, and he said, here's the deal, Scott. We're not sure you're big enough for this job. We're not sure that you're capable. And if you don't figure this thing out ASAP, we're going to find somebody else to do it. Um, that's kind of an oh shit moment. Um, you're kind of like, holy crap, I thought I was really an important person. And you find out very quickly, you're really not that important. And they can backfill you in a second if you don't figure out how to do it. So you figure out how to do it, right? And for me, it was really going back to the roots. It's right, building a forecasting model that was predictive of what was going to happen so that we didn't miss any more forecasts. Finding people you can trust. One of the themes of my career has been finding that those people on the team that you can trust, that understand your style, that complement you, that can make you better. And that was a big thing in this job. That's where I really learned it is you got to have the right people on the team. And I also learned that you got to pay attention to the details, that even if you're this big dude sitting in the corner office, the details are what really matters. And if you don't pay attention to the details, you're probably going to miss out on stuff. Ultimately, I found a management style that worked for me. Probably wouldn't work for anybody else in the room because it's you know kind of this you're a complete jerk one day and you're nice the next day and it's trying to figure out how to blend all that stuff in a way that not only motivates people but gets them to kind of move along with you as you're trying to do things differently. But it's super important as you move up in your career to not be somebody else but be who you are. So I learned that. So career disaster number two. So at this point in time, I do think I'm a big deal, right? I've been running the, snow, the pg and a business for about six years. I took over the snowmobile business. We've been having some success. And we go through this process in Polaris that's kind of allocating our um, innovation money, our product development money. And it's the biggest thing, right? Because if you make those bets well, everything else works. And if you make those bets poorly, nothing works. So my boss says to me that I think you really need to spend money on a four-stroke wide track, OK? And there's like three people in the world that want a four-stroke wide track, and they're somewhere in that northern part of Scandinavia. And they're doing that kind of stuff with hauling wood. I mean, it's the nichiest of niche markets. But he had it in his mind that he wanted a four-stroke wide track, OK? So me being an idiot say, I think that's really a stupid idea. We got a lot better places to spend our money, and we're not going to put a four-stroke wide track into the product plan. And so he says, well, here's a, se here's a severance agreement, Scott. So if you don't want to do the four-stroke wide track, we're going to find somebody else that can. So you make the call. Either the four-stroke wide track goes into the plan, or somebody else moves into the job. So the four-stroke wide track did go into the plan, and it sucked. <laughs> so I still learned that I got to listen to the boss. I work for my wife right now, so then it's super important that you listen to the boss. Um, so my wife and I bought a business together in 2013, um, Quest Engineering. So Quest is not an engineering company. We distribute hydraulic hose and fittings. Um, we sell to companies like Graco, Train, Donaldson, um, you know, ag companies, construction companies, that type of thing. About a $25 million business with 40 employees. We bought another business um, a few years after that called Drand Engineering, which manufactures fire pump test meters, which you've never heard of. But 
Every building that has a sprinkler system needs to test that pump in the sprinkler system, and our meter tests that pump. Um, smaller business, only two people in the world do this, so it's a pretty profitable type business. Um, so we, we own those two businesses. Um, I just want to finish up because I know I'm reaching the end of my time, and uh, I know you guys have tons of questions because you've sit, been sitting there saying, wow, this guy has a lot of interesting information, so I got questions, so I want to make sure we get to that. So what do we look for? So as you're graduating and you start looking for a job, you know, I probably interviewed, I don't know, probably a couple hundred people. Um, out of college when I was at Polaris, and we still hire people out of college at Quest. Here's what we look for, okay? At Quest, we're a big work-life balance company. So we, we know that not everybody wants to work 80 hours a week and work for a big company like I did most of my life. So we want people that are balanced, that they want to work hard when they're at Quest, but they have other stuff to do and enjoy after they leave Quest. Customer, customer, customer. They pay the bills. So the customer is the most important thing. If we don't believe you're customer focused, there's zero chance that you're going to become part of our organization. You got to have integrity. So I say this curious ask questions. We have a guy in our organization, super nice guy, Matt. Matt sits in the corner. Um, he doesn't interact with anybody. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't ask questions. You think Matt has a bright future at, at Quest? No, Matt doesn't have a bright future. You got to have that intellectual curiosity about what else is going on around you to be able to be successful in any role. You gotta be coachable, you gotta be team player, you gotta be flexible. So those are kind of the basics. So here's a few tips for you guys as you go out and start doing interviews. Do your research, okay? If you go into an interview and you know nothing about the company, you have zero chance of getting that job. Zero, I, I guarantee it. Every company wants to know that you've at least been on their website, that you probably have two or three good questions about that company, probably based on their values or their history or some recent financial decision they made. But be curious, show that you've, you're interested and you've done the research. Even if you interview for 20 companies, you owe it to each one of the 20 companies to spend that hour or two, that's all it is, to do the research ahead of time. You got to sell yourself, okay? So again, this goes back to accountants, introverts, not using too many words. There are people in those interviews that are selling themselves hard. Guarantee it. So you have to be prepared to sell yourself in the interview to tell that hiring manager why you are the best candidate for the job. And I know it's hard, because I've been there, but if you don't do it, somebody else is gonna do it and pass you by. Few other things, find a great partner. So Cynthia's not here, so I can say lots of nice things about her. I'd say nice things about her either way. Um, but um, Cynthia and I met at uh, Shell a long time ago. Um, if she was, since she's not here, I'll describe it as a torrid workplace romance. Um, so um, that elevated into a long-term partnership of now we own a business together, raise three kids. So it's super important to find a good partner that you can work with the rest of your life. Soft skills rule, okay? The technical stuff gets you in the door, but if you don't have the soft skills, you're gonna be the person like Matt sitting in that corner for the rest of your life. So work on the soft skills. Get lots of iterations. So read stuff. Watch stuff on TV. I mean, I love Shark Tank, The Prophet. I listen to podcasts. You want to try and understand what else is going on in the world because it's going to help you contribute to wherever you're working for. So iterations, no matter what they are, I, I, I don't know most of the podcast thing in the world, but I hear it's a big deal, so maybe that's the easiest thing for you guys. Um, so that's kind of my tips on what I think is helpful for you guys in your career. Um, that's it for me. So I get to ask, have people ask questions now? Okay. So um, no professors, students have to ask the first questions. 
Um, so who's going to be the person that is working on those soft skills that says, I'm willing to stand up and ask a question of this dude? Um, so what do you got? I'm, I got all night, so thank you. Um, probably when I met my wife. Um, so, I, you know, the, the interesting thing is I was, I was going back through this presentation and, and uh, we, were, we, were on a, we were on a vacation and I was talking to Cynthia about it on the plane and she said, you know, and I was talking to her about Shell and she goes, you know, you were really a jerk back then. Everybody hated you. Um, and I go, well, really? And he, she goes, yeah, people knew you were super smart and got stuff done, but they didn't really like working with you. Um, so I think it was when I got to GE and, you know, there was much more of an emphasis on leadership, teamwork, and I think that's where I started to really notice that the people that were more communicative, the people that, I'll say, sometimes play the games better, are the people that were moving up quicker. And for me, um, I'm super competitive, so I want to figure out how I can progress the quickest. And I think that's where I learned that soft skills is important. It, it's interesting, I, I, I did some little interview. Again, I got coerced into doing that that was videotaped before this. And one of the things that I wish I would have done different when I went here is asked a ton more questions. There's so many people around here that are knowledgeable, that have experienced things that you're going to experience. And instead of asking the questions when I had the opportunity, I had to learn them all the hard way, which takes a lot longer than just trying to get somebody's expertise that's already been through all of that. So I, I think if there's something in your mind that you don't really understand, ask somebody. I mean, old people like us, we don't have much going on. We're happy to help with that, that kind of stuff. It, it gives us something to do. Otherwise, we just sit and watch TV or stuff like that. So ask questions. Yeah, I, I think I think it's 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 really the company you you're interviewing with that you're working for related. Um, I, I would say that for most of the companies that I've worked for, that a master's is important. That it helps maybe to propel you, but it's never been a requirement for getting in the door. I, I think for people in accounting, the CPA certificate that pass the test, that kind of thing, is gives you a lot more credibility. I think, number one, it shows that you have the initiative to go beyond school and pass the CPA exam. Uh, I think it shows that you're probably reasonably intelligent because not everybody can do it. So I, I think from an accounting path, that's a, that pays a lot more dividends than a master's would, at least where I've been. Oh, that's a. So, what were the things that I was unprepared for when I moved up to a manager? Um, I, I think the biggest thing is is that when I manage small groups, if anything went wrong, I, I could just step in and do it myself, and I became very dependent on that characteristic of you know, well, if somebody's not doing the right thing, I'll, I'll just do it. And when you move up to manage a 100-plus person group, there's zero chance of doing that. And I tried to do that and pretty much killed myself because you're working all the time, but you're not going anywhere. I mean, you're literally the groundhog on the wheel. So the, the, thing, that I, the thing that I really learned from that job is how important the people around you are is that to that point, I was too independent, 
and too dependent on my own skill set. And that's what really forced me into figuring out that, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, but I'm a lot better if I can find a team around me that can kind of complement my skills. So that was probably the biggest thing. I, th I think the other thing that I learned is that you, your words become super important when you're in front of a group and you have to say the same words over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, you can't repeat yourself too often, especially when it comes to your high-level strategy, what you're trying to accomplish, your goals. Um, and again, somebody as a few words who picks up things quickly, it's like, well, I told them that once. Why would I have to do it again? And it's like, you, yeah, you got to do it again and again and again. And uh, the other thing on the word side is that um, if you hadn't noticed, I tend to be a little sarcastic. And not everybody gets sarcastic humor. Um, so it can really turn people off. So you have to figure out how to use that humor in a way that's productive as opposed to unproductive. And early on, my sarcasm was a lot more unproductive. And it's still not hugely productive. It's still mainly to amuse myself. Um, but it's better than it was at that point in time. Did I get your question? OK. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is, do I have any better tricks on how you can sell yourself in an interview? So what, what people like me really want to know in an interview is, can you be successful in a job? OK? And that ne doesn't necessarily translate into what classes you had and how you did in those classes and that kind of stuff. What it means is a lot of the other choices you made in your life. OK? So you might have made a choice, like I did, where during the summers when I was in high school and college, I drove a P combine. OK? So you think, what, a, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, here's what it has to do with stuff. So if you sell that story as, I, I, I had this relatively crappy job where I rode in a tractor going three miles an hour through farm fields, and I did that for four summers in a row. But the reason I did it is it paid really well. I, I, I had to get up early. I had to work long days. And I showed that not only could I earn money to pay for my education, but I was willing to do what it took to help that company during the summer for four straight years. And you take those things that you've done in your life and you figure out how to spin them. Probably not a good word. The marketing guy gets it. The rest of the people don't. Um, in such a way that you kind of convert to the things that that company says on their website that's important to them. And what you're trying to do as you prepare for that interview is you look at what their values are, and you think about, in your life to this point in time, what have you done that meshes with those values? Did you have a team that wasn't doing very well, and you kind of took ownership of that team and helped it to be more successful? Um, did you have some kind of problem that you came up with a unique solution for that other people couldn't have came up with or didn't come up with? Did you take a leadership role in some organization? As a general rule, it's not about the number of things that you have on your resume. It's the depth of the things that you have on your resume. We're a lot more interested in depth than the fact that you were in a club that you had no, that you didn't do anything with. That, that's irrelevant to most of us that are interviewing people. We like the people that took some kind of leadership role that did more than just showed up and sat in the back of the class, which is probably why I couldn't get a job today. Did I get? Cool. What else can I answer? Yes, sir. Um, 
I think if you work for Quest, you should stay with us for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, Matt will. <laughs> Um, you know, for, for me, I, I learned a ton from moving around, working for different companies. Um, you know, Shell was a very engineering-driven company. The, the, the accountants were there to do, be, do accounting. I, I was never going to take any kind of business role when I worked for Shell. I, I was going to progress through the accounting organization, and that was it. Um, G was an organization that valued financial people. Um, it was the language the entire organization spoke. It, it was also the place where you learned a lot of the management lessons about people and you know having to prioritize and only having a certain number of things that you can accomplish at a time and um, having to make trade-offs and all those kind of things. You know, Polaris was the first organization that I was really towards the top of the organization, and that's where you can kind of have more of an impact as a culture. I mean, you know, Polaris, for example, had the coolest products in the world, right? You can't beat that from that standpoint of working for that company, but you learn a whole different set of things when you're in a product-driven entrepreneurial company like that. Um, so I, I think there's value in going different places. I think it's all about not doing it too fast. You know, you don't want to have that resume where you get the resume and the person's been in three jobs in four years and you go, there's zero chance they're staying here because every other job they're gone in a year. So it's, showing, it's staying long enough to show that you can contribute, to learn what you can. And if you're not finding that progression anymore, I think it probably is a good chance to try something else. How about how about a female? Do any of the females ask questions, or is it all a male-driven question thing? 100% male-driven question. What is this, Dr. Milner? I mean, <laughs> really, you don't allow women to talk. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm I'm. I, I'm married, I have a wife, and I have three girls, so I'm very comfortable with women. So, I mean, I'll be very nice if you ask a question. I, I've learned that that's the best way to do this. Um, so, I mean, give it a shot. Wow. Okay, I'm going to have to go back to the guys. Really? We'll just, we'll just stay with... <laughs> All right. So that's a that's a great question. So notice for any of the guys I didn't say that was a great question. She asked a great question. No, you guys did too. <laughs> <laughs> so after the problems I ran into, what kept me going? Um, you know, the, the, the first one, you know, when I was in the, the first general manager role, the bigger role, I'm um, outside of camera range, and now I'm going to get, have to go back. Um, so the first one was clearly just me being competitive, that I'm like, I don't want to fail. I've never failed. Um, and it was just, you have something in you that says, you can dig deeper, you can figure this out. Um, and we all have it, it's somewhere in there, it's just whether we want to do it or not. And so competitiveness, fear of failure, you know, all those cliche type of things. The, the second one was actually much harder, the snowmobile one, because I knew I was right. And uh, it's super hard when you know you're right to have to do the wrong thing and then see that it's the wrong thing and not, I mean, it's not like I went back to my boss and said, nan, 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 or boo, boo, you screwed up, you picked the wrong snowmobile. I mean, so you, you just have to swallow it and go in and go, we could have made better decisions, but I was forced into a bad one. That, that was actually a tougher one for me to stay through. And 
that was kind of where Cynthia said, you know, buck up. You're the guy earning the money. You got to figure this out. Go do it. And I'm not sure if she would have said, you need to figure it out. If I would have, if I would have made it through it, but uh, she was really the one in that case that said, "Come on, buddy, dig deep." So I did. Yes, sir. What outside sources most contributed to your success? So one of the things I had on an early slide that I took off is that you learn as much from good bosses as you do from bad bosses. Um, that it's super important, especially early in your career, to understand from that boss what you like about what they're doing and what you don't like about what they're doing. And most of my bosses at Shell were petty micromanagers that, that cared about the details, that couldn't see the big picture, and all they were worried about is checking the box and getting stuff done. And you could see from the morale of everybody that worked for them that it was a really bad way to run an organization, right? Everybody was working for a paycheck, but nobody was enjoying their job. Nobody was going above and beyond. They were just all doing what they needed to to keep the income coming in. I, I eventually had a guy that um, was a kind of a square peg in a round hole and much more of an entrepreneurial type of guy that allowed his team much more freedom. And it, it was like, you know, kind of the window opened and fresh air came in and you have creativity that gets unleashed and you're like, wow, that's really weird how that worked in the same organization. So you pay attention. I mean, in, in, in every organization as you look around, there's people that are successful and you try to figure out why are they successful. I mean, every once in a while you say they got pictures of somebody, but most people are successful because of a reason and you try to figure out what that reason is, and then you say, is there something I can pull from that? And, you know, I, I talk about watching the profit, and I like watching the profit because most of the people on there, they shouldn't be running businesses, right? I mean, it's like, how did you get this business? I mean, how, how, do, you, do, you, how do you even find your way to work every day? But you learn, and you go, well, I could be making that mistake, let me think about that so that I don't do the same thing in my organization. And I said iterations. One of the things that I learned at, at Polaris is that getting people lots of iterations, lots of different experiences, exposures to lots of different things provides them a broader base of knowledge and allows them to make better decisions. So it's trying to figure out how to broaden that base of knowledge as quickly as you can. Yes. Oh, what is my role at my company? Um, that's a very good question. What is the role at my company? So the, the one thing that, that I learned moving from large companies to small companies is when you're in a large company like a Polaris or GE, you're surrounded by a ton of people like you. They're, they're super motivated. They really like to work. They're driven to try to do better. They're looking for changes and improvements. And you have people that you can sit in a room with and have these deep dialogues about things you should do different, how you should change. When you work in a smaller company, we have lots of good people that work for us, but they're working for us because we provide balance in their life. We, we don't email them at night. We don't ask them to work on weekends. We ask them to come in and work hard and do their job. But they're not trying to think about how to move Quest forward. There's only two people trying to figure out how to move Quest forward, it's Cynthia and myself. So you, you, you become much more reliant on the very top of the organization from a strategic standpoint. And it feels kind of lonely at times. The, the other thing that's weird is that you become a lot more involved in people's lives. 
I mean, I, 45 people in the company, and I can tell you, you know, basically everybody's personal story from the last 20 years. You have conversations with them every day. And when you're in an organization that about 30% of the people are um, distribution warehouse type of employees, so non-college degrees, probably had some bad circumstances somewhere in their life that kind of threw them backwards, probably are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, the experience has changed dramatically. I mean, so first, first month we bought the company, um, we have a plainclothes police officer come to our door and say, I think one of your employees has, has uh, an outstanding warrant and we're here to arrest them. And he says, can you just wait until we get all our officers in place so that he doesn't make a run for it. And by the way, we don't think he's armed, but if there's a way to sneak him into this private area so that we can cuff him, that'd be great. You don't have that experience when you work for Polaris. There's other people that take care of it. Um, when you're Quest, whatever pops up is, is what you work on. And you're a lot more productive because you're working in the business, doing things every day. You're not doing PowerPoint presentations or sitting in meetings. Um, so that's a positive, but it's different. I mean, it, it's, I would say that it would have been hard for me to do this at the age of 30. I, I love it at the age of 55. Got to answer your question? Cool. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, so uh, being an introvert, introvert, you know, how did I force myself to become more communicative, more extroverted, and then how did I compete with the people that were more extroverted? Um, you know, so I'm still an introvert. Um, that doing this kind of stuff, I, I, I like doing it when I'm in the middle of it. But when I'm done with it, I'm drained. I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody. So there's a, there's a part of you that says that you have to figure out where inside of you that you can find this energy, this excitement. Almost force yourself early on to put yourselves in positions where you have to be more extroverted, where like you did, you ask a question in a, in a broad group where you go, oh man, this might be a dumb question that everybody will ask. There is no such thing as dumb questions. They're all good questions. So that type of thing is exactly the thing that you have to do. Early on, it's like being in a staff meeting and being willing to speak up and share your opinion. You know, taking the opportunity, if you have a chance to do a presentation, to do the presentation. I mean, they seem like they're miserable. I can't imagine if I had to do this when I was your age. I mean, this would have been like torture for me to have to stand up in front of a group of people and present, um, all of them staring at you blankly like, holy crap, I don't know what he's even saying. Um, but you get to the point where you go, you know, I'm going to enjoy myself when I do this. I, you, you can see I amuse myself throughout this. I amuse two or three people in the room as well, but for the most part, I amuse myself. So it, it, it is literally a exercise in forcing yourself to say, I got to use my words. The, the, the competing with extrovert thing was actually easier. Um, as an introvert, you tend to surround yourself with extroverts, right? That if you can find people that will fill the space and you don't have to, that, that, that makes life a lot easier, right? So you gravitate to the people that are sales-oriented because they'll talk. They'll, they don't even care if people are listening to them. They'll just talk for hours on end. <laughs> it's like, you know, find the marketing guys in the room. I mean, they don't have a lot to say, but they'll talk for a long period. <laughs> um, no. Um, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's really about, you know, what you want to do in life. Seriously. It's like, for me, it, it was really important to me 
as a person that I wanted to be as successful as I could be. And the only way that I could do that was to communicate more, to force myself to be more extroverted. You can be very successful in life and maintain being an introvert. I mean, but if you want to progress to the highest levels, they do kind of force you to be able to use your words. It's hard for people to read your minds. So um, I, I think it's baby steps at the end of the day. It's, uh, it's starting to ask the questions. It's going up to somebody at an event and introducing yourself and maybe asking them a personal question that you don't even really care about the answer, but it's part of the exercise that you're going through. Um, it's starting with those little things. And if you start with the little things, the bigger things get a lot easier. Yes? I would. Um, so the question is, if you go back, would you still major in accounting? Um, I would major in accounting. Um, I think it's the best platform to expand on of anything in the business field. I think it gives you those basics of, again, I probably brought up financial statements eight times in this presentation, but by being able to read and interpret financial statements, it, it's what drives business. I mean, it's what you look at every day to figure out what's going well, what's not going well, how do I improve? And accounting gives you that platform more than anyone. Um, so I, I think it, it, it is a great place to start. Um, and I think, you know, no matter which path you chose, I mean, I chose going into corporate right away, but I mean, there's people that come out of public accounting and move into corporate and they're successful too. I couldn't have done that, as you could probably tell that I don't follow the rules that well. Um, but um, accounting's a great place to start. Highly, I highly recommend it. Well, on that note, I'm going to end it for right now so we can continue the conversation at our reception, which is also paid for by the Benson Management, including your first drink, whether it's alcohol or non. As you can tell, Scott's really hard to approach <laughs> and would be difficult to talk to. So you might want to come and talk to him. But the other thing is, one thing he didn't tell you is that he travels quite a bit international, uh, internationally, so he just got back from Dubai. So if you're interested in places to go and things to see and places you can go along with his presentation, he's certainly someone to chat up along these lines. And with that, let's give Scott a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank and you. thank you very much. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate the gift. We really appreciate your time. I mean, you're just giving us everything, so we do um, love that you're here. Thank All you. right, so we're going to go to the Hall of Nations. We can have snacks. We can have drinks. We can chat Scott up. You can chat each other up. So look forward to seeing you there. And thank you for coming. <laughs>